I'm uh, Peter Stansky. I'm here as a member of the program committee. Uh, but also, it's uh, my pers deep personal and professional honor uh, to introduce my colleague, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Estelle Friedman. Uh, Estelle is, I think, uh, the, the most distinguished historian of American feminism in, 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 and much else besides in, in, in the country today. And we're deeply, deeply pleased uh, that she's, had her, she's having her career at Stanford. She graduated from Barnard and then did a PhD at Columbia and then, then came, came, came to Stanford in um, 1976 or 77, and, and uh, has been here much to the benefit of the university and the wider academic world ever since. I, I do brief introductions because the main, the main point is to hear the speaker, uh, but I will just tell you uh, that Estelle uh, has, has had innumerable honors, innumerable fellowships, a Guggenheim. Uh, she's also won, which is particularly close to, uh, to uh, I'm particularly pleased about. Uh, she was given the, uh, the Nancy Rilke Prize from the American Historical Association for mentorship, uh, named, named after a dear friend of mine. And so that gives me uh, a, a personal pleasure she, she's, ha she's had fellowships at the Behavioral Sciences Center, at the Humani Humanities Center. Uh, she's won, she's won in innumerable prizes, and uh, she's the co-founder of the Feminist Studies Program uh, here at Stanford, uh, and she's written uh, quite a few Im extremely important, wonderful, and prize-winning books, and I'll just provide some of the titles. Her first book, their Sisters Keepers, Women's Prison Reform in America, 1830-1930, Intimate Matters, A History of Sexuality in America, No Turning Back, The History of Feminism and the Future of Women, Feminism, Sexuality, and Politics, a collection of essays by, by Estelle, and then most recently, and a subject obviously of great contemporary interest, Alas, you might say, one might say, but also very positively in the changing of our culture, redefining rape, sexual violence in the, in the era of suffrage and segregation. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Estelle Friedman talking on the topic Women, women in Stanford, Exclusion, Exclusion, and Activism from the 1890s to the 1990s. Thank you. Are you going to use this? Yeah. You can I'll hold on to that for later. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to turn this on. Are we set with our lighting? Yes. Great. Thank you, Peter, for agreeing to. I think we. Is that second bit? Okay. For agreeing to introduce me for the lovely introduction, and thank you all for being here today. I also want to thank Michelle Marinkovich. It's her fault that I'm here. <laughs> she invited me last summer, and I accepted, and I'm very glad that I had a chance to think about this topic. Thanks to Charlotte, also um, Quack Glosser, for all the arrangements, and to all the past and present university archivists who make the study of women at Stanford possible. And I'll particularly mention Roxanne Nyland and Daniel Hartwig. Uh, I especially want to thank Dr. Um, Natalie Marine Street, who directs the oral history program at the Stanford Historical Society and to all the volunteers who have produced the oral histories that, as you'll see, will enrich this study. Um, I would be happy to get more volunteers from this group as we begin a Stanford Women's uh, Community Oral History Project, and we can talk about more, that more later if you'd like. So when I was asked to talk about the history of women at Stanford, to this audience, I first thought, what do you already know about this? And how can I go beyond that? What's been in Stanford Magazine? What's been in Stanstone and Tile? What dominates the archives and the wonderful picture collection in green? And a few subjects came to mind immediately. I figured everybody knows about Jane Stanford. And I will talk about her. 
And then if you look at the pictures, the most second frequent pictures would be, of course, Stanford women's athletics from then till now. Uh, and then, of course, there are our famous graduates, some of whom you may recognize and some you may not. We have, of course, Sandra Day O'Connor, Mae Jamison, lately in the news, Carolyn Lewis Otteneve, who, for whom the current Sarah House is to be renamed, and Sally Ride, for whom the current Sarah House dorm will be renamed. All of this is worth knowing about, and I'll even mention some of it today, but I think it's also worth thinking about many other women at Stanford who we know less about. And I'm not going to be talking much about them either, but let's at least mention the important librarians who make it all possible and the other administrative staff that's been dominated by women for decades. Um, then there are all of the workers, uh, rare in the university archives, but sometimes mentioned, for example, in reading the oral histories, there's a discussion of the African-American African woman cook who was hired by a group of women faculty and cooked for these several women who lived in a kind of communal household on campus, I'll be talking about that, back in the 1930s and 40s. Or a passing mention in oral history by a medical student who, on hearing the news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, recalled, quote, we, we had little Japanese women as our housekeepers in the dormitory for many months. It was sad, very sad. They got to crying, and it was terrible who would know about the rest of their story. There's probably nothing else in the sources. And let's not forget, of course, the wives of faculty, best known perhaps Jing Lyman. These are the women who supported the academic mission, not just as book typists and editors and dinner party hosts, as resident fellows, often also as adjunct lecturers, especially back in the day of the nepotism rule, where you could get hired if your spouse, usually husband, was on the faculty. Um, so many more categories, but I, my strategy today is to limit my subject to primarily two sources, uh, two, two, two subjects, undergraduate women and women faculty. Now, I'll have some reference to others, but I will not be talking about sororities and I will not be talking about sports. I will be selective and episodic. This is not a comprehensive history. And I'm gonna talk about essentially three periods and then place each in historical context to illustrate continuity and change in the first century of women at Stanford. Uh, roughly, the first is the period from the first half century, essentially, of the university, a period when the inclusion of women was set for students and faculty, but also the ways they were simultaneously excluded or limited. Then there's the second period, which is just a short set of snapshots of the immediate post-War II period, uh, the so-called feminine mystique generation in the uh, late 40s and into the mid-50s. And then last, the 60s to the 90s, where I want to hint about how feminist revolutions manifested at Stanford for undergrads and influenced the hiring and institution building among some women faculty. Now, my overall argument is that from the outset, the inclusion of women at Stanford existed within a clear set of boundaries on their education. And this was not only in numerical quotas, but in the mission that was reflected of broader societal tensions over changing gender roles at the time of the founding and after. Yes, women deserved education, but not for the same reasons or with the same opportunities as men. Stanford welcomed women students and to a far lesser degree, women faculty and scholars, as long as they remain primarily in supportive roles to men. And that legacy outlasted the quota system. Now, to be clear, both women students and women faculty enjoyed the benefits of Stanford, whether as an education or as an employment, despite the limits. Most of them were not complaining, at least in the first two periods though we do have some historical evidence of the ways that individuals chafed against the restrictions. But women's discontent erupted in the context of the 60s and afterwards within those social movements so that by the end of the century, women students and faculty, along with male allies, identified deep structures of gender inequality at Stanford. The story of their efforts to change the institution, however, remains a work in progress for reasons that I'll contemplate at the end. I'm again in that early period of inclusion and exclusion from the 90s through the 30s. 
The story of how Stanford became a co-ed university at its opening in 1891, and then how it limited women's opportunity is really an oft-told tale of Jane Stanford's seeming reversal of commitment to women's higher education. I want to start, though, by stepping back to the larger national context for a moment of why we would even be contemplating women at Stanford. So women's education in the 19th century, well, higher education for, for anyone is very rare. Very few Americans are going to college in the 19th century. The original universities um, were the Ivy Leagues were for training male clergy in the colonial period. And then even with the professions in science in the 19th century, it's largely elite white males and very few of them who go to college. For women beyond the common schools, if you were going to have any advanced education in much of the 19th century, it would be in an academy, a female academy, or a female <laughs> seminary. But uh, and often ornamental education, as they said, languages, painting, not necessarily hardcore. By the late 19th century, though, there are new opportunities. First, from the 1860s on, there are women's colleges that are opening. The sister schools that you may have heard of, whether it's Holyoke or Barnard, Wellesley, et cetera. Uh, also, Spelman College for African American women in the South. Um, and in 1870, about well, more than half of the women who were in college were in single sex institutions. But by 1890, only 30% of the women in higher education were in single sex institutions because of these other two points the state schools and the private universities that take off in the late 19th century. Uh, these were the co ed schools in the states were often called land-grant institutions. So the states would give some land for the building of them. University of Michigan is a very good example, but a lot of those Big Ten schools. Um, the agricultural and technical schools in many Midwestern and Southern states, a lot of these schools began co-ed because they were public, taxpayer-funded. Um, they're also among the historically black colleges and universities, as we call them today. Schools like Howard started out being co-educational in this period. That increases opportunity for women. So do a few private universities that begin in the 1890s because of the great wealth of their benefactors. And the two big ones are the University of Chicago and Stanford University. And each of those admits women from the beginning. Some people will say because there was a depression in the 1890s and they needed the money. But I don't think that's the whole story at all. Um, you can see the takeoff in uh, women as a percent of all BAs from 1870, 14%, 1900, 19%, by 1920, up to 34%. And we'll keep tracking that during the hour. This increase of women's college education was not without controversy. Even before the takeoff in the early 20th century, critics were warning about the dangers of gender disorder, of immorality. They love this pamphlet called Is College Bad for Girls? It came out in 1905. And I don't know if you can see the details, but she's smoking. The Racy Police Gazette is there. The negligee, I can't even talk about that. Um, you know, so these young women who are going off to college are going to wind up practically prostitutes. Um, earlier, though, there were controversies over was college bad for women's health? Some of you may be familiar with the famous or infamous Dr. Clark from Harvard Medical School, who in the 1870s wrote a book about sex and education in which he argued, and we have to understand it's within Darwinian sexual selection theories, but it's also at a time of a closed energy system uh, set of beliefs. And he pointed out that college women were having fewer children than non-college women. And he blamed it on education because in this closed energy system, he said, the brain power, that energy they were using in their brains was taking away their womb power. <laughs> and so, and, and this is like feeding into the late 19th century, quote, race suicide fears that white women are not having as many children as women of color, immigrant women, and so, which really escalates in the early 20th century. But the idea that women should be mothers, not be educated, was one of the oppositional arguments. Um, well, those educated women got together. Marion Talbot, who became a dean of women at the University of Chicago, uh, formed something called the Association of Collegiate Alumni, which later became the AAUW, the American Association of University of Women, which I am a member, and I suspect others in the room may be. 
And one of the first things they did were scientific studies using control groups to test about differential fertility rates and discovered that it was not some biological loss used to brain power, but the social fact that college women married later than non-college women, and that's why they had fewer children. So they were, for their whole history, this organization has been trying to support women and girls' equity in education. So this is the context when Stanford begins. Is it bad for women? Is it good for women? Can they handle it? Um, so why women students at Stanford from the outset? All of the leading figures, Leland and Jane Stanford, um, David Starr Jordan, the first president of the university, had mixed feelings about why and how to educate women. That reflected the depth of what historians have called the separate spheres ideology of the 19th century. Even as women enter higher education, they were seen as wives and mothers first, men for the public world, women aiming for the domestic world. In the Articles of Endowment, Leland Stanford included, and I quote, we have provided that the education of the sexes shall be equal, deeming it of special importance that those who are to be mothers of the future generation shall be fitted to mold and direct the infantile mind at its most critical period. Well, some women were looking beyond motherhood by the time of the founding of the university. Some women wanted to be mothers of civilization, of the world, the reformers who were trying to clean up politics or clean up uh, the milk supply for their children. Um, and some of them were actually seeking suffrage, which we know Jane Stanford supported. Since Jane Stanford took over the supervision of the building of Stanford after her husband's death in 1893, her views are really critical. So just for a moment, let's think about Jane Stanford. Jane Lathrop Stanford had attended a girls' academy back in Albany, New York. Later, with the wealth that her husband accrued in California, she became active in philanthropy and reform. And she did not have a child until she was in her, I believe, late 30s. Um, she spent time establishing kindergartens and hospitals. Although Leland Stanford Junior, Univers Junior University was a monument to her deceased son, she did believe in the education of women within certain traditional frameworks. Whoops. Jane Stanford. I believe by so educating them, they will be made stronger physically and mentally and better fitted for wives and mothers. And I believe that if the vocations of life are thrown open to them without their engaging in anything unsuitable to their sex, <laughs> they can add another 25% to the power of production of this country. And this will go far towards realizing the possibility of giving comfort and elegance to every person. Separate goals, equal education. Now, not all of the university founders agreed with her goals. For example, President David Starr Jordan clearly reflected Victorian-era gender ideologies. Women, he explained, I quote, lack on the whole originality. Now, let's read from David Starr Jordan. Women take up higher education because they enjoy it, men because their careers depend upon it. Only men, broadly speaking, are capable of objective studies. Original investigation, creative art, the resolute facing the world as it is, all belong to a man's world, not at all to that of the average woman. Jane Stanford, as you know, controlled the purse. And when the university opened in 1891, she ensured that women had equal access, not only to admission, but she um, indeed sped up the building of Robley Hall. These are women students flexing their identities, getting ready for a Dress, fancy dress party. Well, back to David Starr Jordan, though. Over his time, Jordan adopted more of Jane Stanford's views. And looking back in his memoir in 1921, he did accept higher education for women for reasons suggestive, again, of the ideological legacy of Stanford's co-education. For college men, there is no other influence so wholesome as that of educated women. There exist no conditions more favorable for the choice of a life mate that are found in a co-educational institution. This is, of course, not the whole story, but to my mind, the advantages to both men and women distinctly outweigh all the incidental drawbacks. <laughs> well, Jordan and Jane Stanford agreed at the opening that women and men would be admitted on identical terms, and all courses open to women, and including the sciences. In 1891, around 30% of the original 440 students were female. 
But as you probably know, the numbers of women enrolling increased each year for the next decade faster than the number of men. Now, men were still in the majority, but by 1899, 40% of the students were female. This was comparable, by the way, to Chicago and Berkeley. This was happening elsewhere. But Stanford took, a, took action that was different. The going wisdom was Mrs. Stanford feared that the college established in memory of her son was becoming a woman's college. And in 1899, she proposed a limit of 500 women. Now, that goal was reached by 1904. So there were about 30% 1891. You got to uh, the cap was imposed 1899. It was going down. And uh, by 1904, women were, the 500 was 35%. So you wound up with a dual admission system. Men, it was open admissions. And this was in the no tuition period. For women, there was a quota. So it was harder to get in. The waiting list for women got backlogged. There were four times as many women applying as could be admitted. And they actually halted women's applications in the 1920s to catch up with years of backlog of women trying to come. In a way, I look at these numbers, and I think, I think this meant women had to be three times more qualified than men to get into Stanford. So women's percent was declining at the 500 cap as men's numbers were increasing. And even after the university instituted tuition in the 1920s, this was still going on, lots of men increasing. It went against a national trend of increasing enrollments of women at colleges and universities. Um, in 1930, 40% of all BA degrees were going to women. Now, the big change comes with the Depression. Uh, in 1929, the long economic depression begins to reduce the male applicant pool. Enrollment dropped overall 18% over the next several years. The universities wanted they needed more applicants, so they lowered the uh, requirements, uh, the average you needed to get in, and they still couldn't get enough men. So as President Ray Lyman Wilbur explained in his annual report, and I quote, the financial emergency now faced by the university brought into clear perspective the folly of continuing with the limitation of 500. Welcome back, ladies. <laughs> this is the headline from the Daily. More women will enter as ruling spells end of 500. Because it was expedient then, Stanford listed the cap in 1933, and women's enrollment doubled once given the opportunity to attend. It had really gone down to, uh, let's see, 14%, yeah, in 1933. Um, but it was not the end of the quota system. Stanford actually instituted a quota to the level before the 500 cap. So there would never be more than 40% 40, 40 of women and the common parlance for many students was three men for every one woman. That was the standard. And that quota stayed in place until 1973. Now, I'll get back to that story. But first, I want to turn to early women faculty and give some comparisons. I think the faculty story will further illustrate how double standards of Inclusion but limitation on full participation characterized this period. So a little national context, um, increasing graduate training and academic positions for women are part of the story of higher education. Uh, in 1870, women constituted only 12% of college faculty. By 1940, the peak for a long time was at 28%. So they're definitely in the minority, but it is growing. Now, some of these women are in applied fields with vocational education. Uh, home economics is home to many of them, even those with PhDs in chemistry. Teacher education, nursing, women's phys ed, and health. There was a whole separate women's world within higher education, particularly in universities. These were the lowest paid and lowest status jobs in many schools. Now, at Stanford, women's participation in faculty was far below the national average. Um, I'll give you some data, but also just one illustration. This is Mary Barnes, who was an assistant professor of history in the 1890s. She was here for several years in the early period. From looking through the listing of faculty, uh, Stanford was never more than um, 3 to 4% up to 1931. And even in the 1930s and 40s, 
never more than four to six percent women faculty. Uh, that's a, that's full time faculty, uh, at a time when the increase uh, in other schools was much greater. The and I should also say most of these women are not married, or if married, do not have children. The low percent of faculty at Stanford is not unrelated to the quota on women students. In both public and private institutions, we find a correlation between the percent of women in the student population and the number and rank of women faculty. So the, private, the women's colleges had the highest proportion of women faculty. The all-male schools, the Ivy League, et cetera, had the lowest proportion. And in between were the co-ed schools. And the number of women faculty depended a lot on how many women were there. Stanford had capped the number of women. It had put, really, an artificial limit, not just on women as students, but on women as faculty. And the rank of those faculty is worth noting, as well as the low numbers. At the outset, there were several women faculty who were all clustered at the lowest level, many of them instructors, not full-time faculty, a few assistant professors like Mary Barnes. It's probably one of the reasons so many of them left. There was high turnover in the early years because they were low paid and low status. Of the original faculty, only two went on to become full professors to go all the way up through the ranks. That's just from the early years. Looking from 1891 to 1931, there were 28 women appointed full-time professors. Of those 28, only 20% ever made it all the way to the rank of full professor. And several of those got to full professor one or two years before they retired. Let me give you two examples from Stanford to illustrate this inclusion-exclusion story for faculty. And my examples are Dr. Cleelia Mosher and Dean of Women Mary Yost. Clearly, Mosher was a Stanford graduate, a BA and MA in physiology. Uh, she then got her medical degree from Johns Hopkins and became a trailblazing female physician and a prolific author. Mosher's published studies refuted those contemporary views of women's physiology. Uh, she said women's bodies did not disqualify them from higher education or from any male-dominated professions or from athletics. Uh, she wrote articles, she wrote books, uh, she wrote about topics that had never been written about. She did studies of menstruation, and perhaps her most famous contribution, which wasn't published until 1980, is what's known as the Mosher Survey, or the Study of Physiology and Hygiene of Marriage with Some Considerations of the Birth Rate. It was the first sex survey of women in the United States. And I should add that my colleague, Carl Degler, was the one who discovered it in the Stanford archives and was responsible for getting it published in 1980. Mosher came to Stanford in 1910 as an assistant professor of personal hygiene. But that wasn't all her job description had. Many women got into colleges and universities through administrative roles. She was also the medical advisor to women and the director of Robley Gym, the women's gym at the time. She remained an assistant professor until 1927. In that year, she was promoted to associate professor, in 1928 to full professor, and the next year she became one of the first emerita faculty. Now, Mosher was more of a loner on campus. She was not really part of the women's faculty community. In contrast to Mary Yost, who had a PhD from Michigan and had taught at Vassar before she was recruited to be the third dean of women. She served in that capacity from 1921 until 1946. She was the first dean of women, though, to get a faculty appointment. In 1921, English professor Raymond Alden wrote about President Wilbur's plan to make Yost a faculty member in English. Quote, we should be very cautious about increasing the feminine proportion, quote, of the English department, because they already had several women professors. Now, Yost was no radical. She was a strong supporter of women's traditional roles, um, that women's work should be the kinds of work that were suitable to women. She was a strong supporter of the nursing school, for one thing. Um, she believed women should be prepared for marriage, but she was considered somehow threatening by virtue of being female. Yost created a unique household on campus. On Lesuan Street, and I'm trying to get my bearings, actually, as the crow flies, Right over there, I believe, 
where White Plaza is now, there was a house, and she lived there and invited other women faculty to live there with her. So for around 25 years, until her retirement, she lived with a combination of, but particularly a core, of four, two sets of friends, two sets of friends, and herself. And this included um, Edith Mirrelees, the English and writing professor, Betty Buckingham, um, English professor Terry Russell, and Nina Almond, who was a librarian at Hoover. They had a mutual housekeeping uh, experience. They're the ones who hired the African-American woman cook I mentioned earlier. And this arrangement was partly financial. They had low salaries. They really couldn't establish their own households, so they banded together. And it was a social world for, one of them was widowed, but the others were unmarried. It was a social world for women who did not have families uh, on campus. Now, we have some evidence that status and salary issues made these women feel less valued than male faculty. For example, Betty Buckingham and Terry Russell once wrote a satire based, uh, or at least they took the name, from Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. And they recommended a way to solve the problems of higher education. And this is probably during the Depression, so they're worried about money. And I'll quote it. We simply put under a more economical administration and give overall teaching to the women. Good ladies would be quite willing to do the same work for half pay, having for the most part docile dispositions and limited commercial vision. And since the instruction of youth is accounted by its administrators to be unworthy of full remuneration, this will seem a fair wage, both to the thrifty employers and to the grateful employees who, in your due to feeding on crumbs, will feel passing rich on half a loaf. <laughs> Though she wasn't part of their network, the legendary English and drama professor Marjorie Bailey also felt the double standard. In 1949, according to the Stanford Daily, Bailey said that she felt women in the professional fields, quote, have to be far superior to men in order to succeed. And she lamented that, quote, females are rarely, if ever, allowed to function on general university committees. She, too, struggled to get promoted to full professor until late in her career and had to do a lot of jockeying through the president to have it happen. In private correspondence, Bailey suggested the toll of women's secondary status. And I'm going to uh, quote part of this long passage that she wrote in a letter to a male colleague, a friend. I am all through devotedly serving this and that for love of it and getting the face smacked in with a Prussian heel as a result. One doesn't expect gratitude as a reward, but one does expect comprehension and recognition. I'm obliged to hear maudlin comment of the smitten student type or get what amusement I can out of the unquestionable fear and jumpiness of my immediate colleagues. It is not a good way to live. This is in 1949 that she was writing this. Now, I offer these examples not to indict Stanford. I'm surely these practices persisted at other universities. And the all-male Ivy League wasn't even opening its doors to women faculty. Certainly, for some women faculty, Stanford was a good way to live, especially if they did not aspire to equal treatment, if they did not mind the lower salaries and status, if they found enough satisfaction in the community of women or in the rewards of working with their male and female students. Rather, like the women students who were lucky enough to be admitted under the quota, such as these cap and gown honor society women we saw at the opening, the very few women faculty benefited from Stanford, but often in a separate and sometimes second place women's world a theme that persists in the second period that I would like to talk about. This is sort of an interlude, snapshots of some of the students from the 1940s and 1950s, particularly the late 40s and early 50s. And I've chosen this partly because we have a rich oral history record for this period. The context now, and right after World War II, is huge growth in higher education in the United States. For men and women, increasing entry, but much greater gains for men, partly because of something called the GI Bill, so that male veterans could get paid to go back to school, 
And even though women are going to college, so many more men are going that there's a gap in the percentage that grows. That's really in the late 50, 40s and early 50s. By the mid 50s, women are catching up in the percentages because a lot of those vets have gotten through the system. Now, let's take a look at some of the data. Um, I'll, first of all, for the BA degrees, this is again for the United States, uh, goes down from 1940 to 50, 41% to 24% of women are women's. And then, as you can see, by the mid 50s, it's beginning to come back up a little bit. The faculty story, as I said earlier, there's a peak in 1940, 28% nationally, and then that does continue to go down. And I'll pick that story up a little bit later. So the context of the post-war uh, college women, this is the baby boom era. It is the first increase in birth rates in the United States since, really, 1800. They'd been going down and down. And in the post-war period, they go up just for that short baby boom generation. It's also the period Betty Friedan later called the feminine mystique, uh, a time when even some educators questioned the need for higher education for women. And indeed, an uh, increasing number of college women, women went to college, dropped out to get married, and begin to have their families. At Stanford, the quota system, of course, was limiting women to about one-third to 40%. So it's hard to know what would have happened with enrollment if it had been open. But for those women who did come to Stanford in this period, we have some evidence of what it was like. We're talking about white, middle-class women who are smart enough to get into Stanford, even with the quota. They are interested in marriage, but they're also interested in doing well in school, and many of them have career aspirations. And the pictures do not go with the people who I'm going to be quoting, but they're from the time, just to give you a feeling. Three themes recurred in the oral histories that were done at the 50th reunions of the classes from the late 40s through the early 50s, really through the late 50s. Uh, I'll talk about each of them, but they are the hatred of the restrictions on women, the love of the camaraderie with women, and the disappointment about the way faculty treated their career aspirations. First, they hated parietal hours and the dress code. <laughs> One graduate summarized the resentment of surveillance that recurred in the interviews, and I quote, I remember the clothing. The women had to, we could never wear pants on campus. We had to wear skirts. And we had to sign into the dormitories. We had to be in by 10.30 at night. You signed out, and then you signed in when you came in, and you had certain weekends. I think it was 1 or 1.30 a.m. You had to keep, tra keep track of your hours and how many weekends that you could be free. I don't know. There must have been overnights. There were. We were, the women were rather strictly guarded. Now, it was, the rules were not without some supporters. As one woman recalled, we felt, as 18-year-olds, that was a good thing because we had an excuse to say we need to go home. <laughs> that was sort of a comfort zone to be in. And then there were all the comments on the clothing rules, the dress code. No pants in public except Sunday. You could wear them in the dorms. But if you wanted to go, they would always, we had to go mail a letter at the post office. We had to put a skirt on over our jeans. Um, then there was the difficulty if you were going to lab in the sciences, you had to wear a skirt and you didn't want to because of some of the kinds of things that you were doing and the materials you were working with. Um, or if you went riding or to the gym, you then had to leave extra time to get to a class because you had to go back and get out of your pants and get into your skirt. Um, aside from all of the complaints about these restrictions, women reported how much they loved the camaraderie of the women's world at Stanford. Story House, Row Houses, Robley, Women's Council, Women's Honor Society, Women's Sports. As one narrator explained, and women were very close, very. I mean, we all had to live on campus. We had to live together in the dorms. There were no sororities in this period. There was nothing to, we were just really close. Another graduate remembered how she loved living in Lagunita Court with, quote, flowers everywhere and a beautiful little fountain in the front. I loved it there. They had very good food. And it was not co-ed, just women. Now, despite that comment, there are repeated mentions of the favorable gender ratio 
the three men per woman and that were very much in demand um, during this period of dating. So these are some of the uh, just pictures of women from the 1950s. Though they felt intellectually encouraged by faculty, and the faculty, as you know, was primarily male, um, many of them reported on feeling that faculty discouraged their career aspirations. Um, and that they veered them into suitable women's work. So budding scientists still had bitter feelings about exclusions 50 years later. A student who came to Stanford because MIT and Caltech did not admit women, uh, she wanted to do electrical engineering. And she recalled that the dean of women acknowledged that she was qualified for the major, but then said, I would be taking a highly competitive position away from the head of a family, and she could not recommend it, which, quote, upset me to no end, unquote. Another Stanford woman who wanted to major in math recounted what a male faculty member told her. Quote, all women do is get married and have babies. Training them otherwise is a waste of time. The rationales for exclusion could range from the trivial to the deeply cultural. A student went to the engineering department to express her interest. And they said, she's quoting them, you know, we really aren't very interested in you. We only have one bathroom in this corner, so we really aren't very interested in women. <laughs> Another potential engineer noticed that there were no women majors and turned to the career counselors. And I quote, some of the answers I got were fascinating for me as a woman, like, well, most women come here to get married, so we really don't know what to do with someone who wants to major in engineering. And my mouth, I'm quoting her, my mouth would just gape open. She acknowledged that some women managed to major in engineering, but she thought, quote, they were probably better than most of the men in the classes, quote. And there were several students who talked about if you couldn't get in a study group, you couldn't make it in math. And the men had a monopoly on the study groups. And if you had to be a woman, you had to do it on your own because there weren't enough <coughs> women to have a women's study group, and you couldn't be with the men. In any case, the woman I was talking about did find a field she loved, economics. Not only science proved exclusive, a journalism major recalled an encounter with a male professor and how it affected her future. Well, he says, Miss Olson, we have found that women who majored in journalism are wasting their money and our time. All you women do is get married and have babies. So I would recommend you find another department to major in. Well, I kind of walked out of there not, you see, I wasn't incensed. In other words, in those days, women just said, oh, well, we can be a, a teacher or a nurse or a secretary, but I think we'd gone beyond secretary, so I could be a teacher or a nurse, OK. One graduate from the class of 1957 summarized well what many others expressed. Stanford taught me how to think, but it didn't prepare me for a career. At her placement center interview, <clears throat> excuse me, she was asked questions about her boyfriend and her marital intentions. And this left the woman incensed, so she walked out. She later became a college administrator herself. A political science major remembered decades later leaving in tears whenever she met with her advisor, male faculty advisor, because, quote, he was discouraging me from doing anything when she contemplated going into the Foreign Service, for example, he told her, this is her account, well, you're a woman. You will not have any opportunity except if you want to marry someone who's in the Foreign Service who's more outstanding than you. She's continuing, he actually said that. So I left crying again. Equally cutting, her advisor later told her, quote, if you feel that you want to get into a man's world, then you must think like a man. And it made her feel, quote, at Stanford, that the woman's way of thinking was not recognized, really. So we spent a lot of our time trying to figure out what these men, faculty men, wanted. And I think that wasn't unique to Stanford, she continued. I think that was the whole world. Well, that world was about to split open. And that brings me to my third period, the feminist stirrings from the 1960s to the 1990s. Of course, student life didn't change overnight or when a new decade rolled around on the calendar. 
For one, we've already seen how shifts in higher education began in the mid to late 50s. So did forms of protest, whether against Cold War conformity in the 1950s beats or in protests against racial injustice by Southern civil rights activists in Montgomery and elsewhere. Both gender and race relations were already changing by the 60s, although perhaps a bit more slowly at Stanford. A sense of continuity with the past comes through in a reminiscence of an undergraduate uh, from that period reflecting on what it was like to be a female student and a student of color in the mid-60s. Sandra Drake graduated in 1966 and told Stanford Magazine much later, Stanford was a very insular world, a Western California white world. At Robley, it felt like there were 199 giant blondes and me. <laughs> It was culture shock. There were more African students on campus than African Americans. I don't recall any overt hostility, but for a variety of reasons, I remained exclusive. The social scene was totally sexist. At the time, women could not move off campus unless they were 23, a graduate student, or living with their own family. I lasted in the dorm one quarter. As the social movements of the 60s came to Stanford, more students questioned the status quo from racism to patriarchy. And they included, uh, you know, the, the context at the time was the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the anti-war movement, the student movement, Students for Democratic Society, SDS, many others. And it was really in the context of these radical movements that feminism emerged, reborn, since the earlier suffrage movement. And it emerged both from the egalitarian principles of social movements and from the contradictions that women in those movements felt when they did not feel the egalitarianism extended to them. So I should explain, and just to give you some visuals from feminism in the early 70s, <laughs> there were at least two strands nationally, liberal feminism and radical feminism. And liberal feminism focused more on uh, education and employment and the law and enforcing the law, laws like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title IX of the 1972 Education Act, the kinds of things the National Organization for Women were fighting for. Uh, and I will say here, as very importantly, one of the things those laws brought about was the end of the quota on women at Stanford because uh, some women filed a sex discrimination case against Stanford uh, after Title IX and although the suit was not successful, Stanford, I think, saw the handwriting on the wall and in 1973 opened up admissions without the cap. Though it would take decades to reach equity, in 1996, only 41% of the student body was female. So the liberal side is trying to get equal rights law, and we can see how it's working. Then there's the radical side with origins more in new left liberation politics, and here were the radical feminists who, by words, were the personal is political, turning to the family and reproduction and sexuality, domestic violence, rape, harassment, uh, and also to issues of race and class. Now, all of these contexts are present at Stanford. Indeed, as many of you may know or remember, Stanford was a hotbed of protest in the late 60s and early 70s confrontations over the Vietnam War, the role of the Stanford Research Institute, the black student union crisis, the dismissal of Professor Bruce Franklin, the role of the militant Vence Ramos group, and of course, resistance to the draft. This gives you a sense of women's role in resistance to the draft. <laughs> yes, it's a minority of students are in the most radical movements, but they had disruptive effects. All of this clearly seeded the Stanford women's movement, as I know from reading the movement oral histories. One male alum recalled that in 1967, the Stanford Observer, which was one of the print publications, um, included what he called, quote, the first statement of the women's liberation movement that anybody had ever seen around Stanford. It was a complete mind blowout. By the fall of 1969, he continued, quote, women's liberation went crazy in the Bay Area. A lot of people at Stanford who had been around SDS rejected their spouses and went into women's liberation. Reject your spouse because your spouse is a male chauvinist pig. 
A faculty wife who arrived in the late 60s became involved in various left movements, as well as campus consciousness raising groups. Um, I don't look for anybody you know, because this is actually not a Stanford picture. Uh, but there were groups like this on campus. And the women involved differentiated their groups from the Betty Friedan liberal feminists. Um, we didn't talk about what it was to be homebodies, because most of us were. But we read Marx. We read Engels. She later learned that the CR groups had been initiated by Jane Franklin, who was married to Bruce Franklin, and explained, quote, she was out recruiting. And she was using that as a method of recruitment, and I wound up getting recruited. Just as nationally, though, some women on the left found uncomfortable many kinds of sexism. Uh, as one student reported, women, quote, didn't want to be around the, the guys who, when they got into demonstrations, were just running on testosterone. And they wanted to be more with, um, you know, the less violent, the less militant. One group of radical women, primarily undergrads, created a collective called the Women's Union around 1969. And their members uh, saw it, and I quote from one of the oral histories here, saw it very much as a way for women to have their own socialist movement, quote. While, quote, the men in Venceremos saw this as a way for us to recruit women into being their fellow travelers. And it was a constant struggle, a constant tension. Are they the tools of the left, or are they creating an autonomous women's movement? Uh, they organized as women. They drew on campus resources. Now, this is 1969. And I don't know if any of you remember SWAPSI, Stanford Workshops on Political and Social Issues, had started in 69. And the idea was relevant teaching. We're going to teach what matters and really revitalize education. Um, and in that spirit, building on the model and utilizing an earlier women's world at Stanford, the Women's uh, Union created an early feminist space at the YWCA, which I believe was in Old Union. I have conflicting reports from the oral histories. They call it Old Tresseter, but I think they mean Old Union. So the Y had been a thriving women's space for decades on campus, uh, but it was losing membership in the 1960s. The Women's Union, the radical women, approached the Y board, approached the y board which was then headed by Flora Hewlett of Hewlett Packard. And one member recalls, uh, they said to the board, if you let us do a women's center, we'll give this curriculum of alternative courses, and we'll bring you membership. And we did. We brought them tons of membership because everybody had to pay to join the Y in order to take our courses. And they, that's what they did. They, they taught courses. They remember teaching the first women's studies classes at Stanford. So uh, professors would sign off on the curriculum and on the grades, but it was these women from the union who were teaching, for example, Sisterhood is Powerful and Notes from the Second Year. And I quote, but we wanted to teach about Vietnamese women and a lot of stuff about Afri African American women and Latino women. So it was intersectionality from the beginning at Stanford Women's Studies. One of the women's members' husbands taught motorcycle repair to women as part of this group. And for some reason, that was controversial. Um, in any case, the alliance with the Y barely survived the students' strike in the wake of the invasion in Cambodia in 1970. The Women's Union made the Women's Center at the Y strike headquarters. And as a member recalled, quote, Flora Hewlett wasn't happy about that. And she uh, called us to her house where we had a meeting. And it seemed they came to a parting of the ways. But the Women's Union wasn't the only part of the Women's Center Collective. There was the Health Collective, the Rape Collective, the Divorce Clinic, and much more. The Women's Union may have been a small radical group, but over the next decades, feminist organizing spread to a range of student projects. For example, there was a group that called itself Women's Liberation, Stanford Women's Liberation, also meeting in 69. They called for the end of the quota on students, on women's students, and for child care, and for equal opportunity and they invited both men and women to join them. The uh, women's collective, the original women's collective, would eventually become the Women's Center, which fostered the Women's Guide to Stanford, held speakers and events, and remains vital today. I'll let you read their uh, speaking of all of the things that bothered women at the time. <laughs> 
The Women's Center is, has become the Women's Community Center, and the ubiquitous post, uh, bumper sticker on all of the laptops in my classes come from the Women's Community Center. The Women's Community Center is now downstairs at the old fire truck house. And upstairs is the home still to, and was back in 72, the founding of what was then called at first the Gay Students Union, which became the Gay People's Union. And in 1972, when it originated, you had the first meeting of lesbians at Stanford who began to meet weekly, regularly. As you can see, the women's collective was on Tuesday, the men's collective on Wednesday. Uh, and that continued for many years. Another issue in the early, that emerged in the early 1970s was safety for women. And the first women's self-defense classes taught by women in Robley Hall began in the early 1970s. As one alum described the teaching her, quote, that I was entitled to pay attention to my fears, then to learn self-defense techniques to fight or to fight back or to release myself, it was fabulous. It was such an incredible opportunity to have to create a sense of empowerment. In 1974, uh, students created the Rape Education Project, uh, and it continued, excuse me, in 1978, they created the Rape Education Project, which continued in 1986. They created the um, Issues in Self-Defense for Women classes, which continued for many years. And uh, they held weeks-long speakers, events, uh, focusing on acquaintance weight particularly. Now, there was much more activism in the 1970s and much unfinished business that I'm not speaking about. But I would like to turn from students to faculty. And I just will begin. This is Ann Minor, who was the first affirmative action officer. Uh, this was her in 1971. She took the job in 1972 just to suggest what else was going on on campus. She wrote in her, or she said in her oral history, there were all these spontaneous things happening. There was the YWCA, the Stanford Distaff Club, which was women faculty and women's staff, the Stanford Faculty Women's Club, which was then comprised of uh, faculty wives. Minor brought many of these groups together in something called a women's forum, and she successfully established a university committee on the education and employment of women. It did some investigating, and it found and reported that only 4.5% of all Stanford women faculty, Stanford faculty were women. There were no women faculty at all in four of the university's seven schools. Only 2% of full professors were women, and no woman had ever been a dean. And we entered the period that um, it's the first woman period, when we, Stanford really tries to fill in some of the holes where there are no women. Uh, in fact, Stanford was aware enough of the problem that in 1972, the university held a news conference in San Francisco to introduce the world to three of these first women who had been hired in their schools. Barbara Babcock, you see both up in the corner, and here she is, the lone woman in the law school. Um, and then uh, Lily Young in engineering and Myra Strober, in the economist in the GSB. Both... Barbara Babcock and Myra Strober have written wonderful memoirs that I highly recommend, and their oral histories provide rich details about their careers. These are those memoirs. Uh, both Babcock, uh, excuse me, Babcock attributed those hirings to the context of the Times, quote, a little window of affirmative action. Only very recently, she said, the law school factor, faculty openly questioned when, whether any woman could be as qualified as a man. But then the increase of women law students, when quotas were being lifted on professional schools, uh, the usual quota on women in medical and law, medicine and law at the time had been 5%. And as soon as those quotas were lifted, the numbers go up. Um, so this helps in the demand for women faculty. But still, Babcock explained in her interview, quote, it didn't happen very fast. Let me tell you that. For the first five years I was here, there were no other women here in the law school. Local women's networks influenced hiring as well, as oral histories illustrate. Um, I don't have a picture of her at the time, but this is Marion Lewinstein. <laughs> 
1974, journalist Marian Lewinstein had recently contributed a chapter to a book about women's careers. And she realized that many of the women she was working with, it turned out, were faculty wives or had administrative jobs at Stanford. And it turned out, she recalled, that they talked up my name around Stanford. The communications department, under pressure of a potential sexual discrimination charge, soon hired Lewinstein. Like other interviewees, Lewinstein also credited Jing Lyman, who was by then the wife of the president, Richard Lyman, uh, with making Stanford welcoming to women faculty. I quote Marion Lewinstein. She played a part in trying to introduce women professors around so that they weren't too isolated. She invited the likes of Marion and myself to lunch where I met her. And I realized that because it was in the oral history. Now, not everyone felt as welcome, predictably, when race compounded the isolation. Sandra Drake returned as a faculty member in 1976 and has told Stanford Magazine, quote, when I came back to teach at Stanford, I had problems more with faculty than with students. I was one of two African Americans in the English department, but there were no Asian Americans, no people from the third world, and only three women in a department of 40. Stanford began tr tried to address underrepresentation, including, for example, the hiring in 1974 of Cecilia Bursiaga, who for 20 years, as an assistant provost for Chicano affairs, as provost for faculty affairs, and more, worked to increase the representation of Latinx, African American, Native American, and female faculty at Stanford. Indeed, when she was terminated in 1994, students went on a hunger strike. Hiring and retaining a diverse faculty proved extremely challenging to Stanford, as at other elite universities. Yet creating even a small critical mass of women and minority faculty did help to institutionalize change. And I would just like to cite two lasting feminist institutions on campus that formed during this period. The first is the Center for Research on Women, founded in 1974. <clears throat> Myra Strober recounts its origins when she introduced some undergraduate and graduate women who had separately come to her saying, why don't we have a center on, on research on women. And Strober then turned to senior faculty such as Eleanor Maccabee in psychology and Jim March in education. Uh, and they initially co-chaired a policy board for what would become CROW, the Center for Research on Women. And just a nod to Artie Bienenstock, who's in the audience, was one of the early male allies of that institution. The ubiquitous Jing Lyman took a leading role in networking and fundraising. Now, there was opposition even to the idea of a center for research on women when Strober tried to get some university funding. She recalls that an administrator asked for reassurance that addressing the issue of gender would not require a long-term university commitment. <laughs> now, I'm going to be quoting Myra Strober here. When the, problems of, when the problems Crow deals with no longer exist, he inquired, would she agree they could close the center? <laughs> Strober recalls answering with the utmost seriousness, yes, as soon as all these problems are solved, Crow should be shut down. <laughs> Today, of course, the problems remain, and so does the expanded and renamed Clayman Institute for Gender Research, which sponsors the Jing Lyman Lectures. I just want to show you this picture of some of the later directors, uh, Myra Strober, uh, not in order of service, um, the late Diane Middlebrook, Barbara Jelpe, uh, are over here, uh, Deborah Rohde, and Londa Schiebinger. And not on this slide are Laura Karstensen and the current director, Shelley Carell. The other institution, a lasting institution from this period, is the Program in Feminist Studies. Now, shortly after I arrived in the late 70s, a group of women faculty began meeting regularly to educate ourselves about interdisciplinary feminist scholarship. And we called ourselves the Crow Group after the institute's name, the center's name. We also began to circulate lists of classes that people were offering related to women and gender. And uh, in 1979, through Crow, we released a report on the task force on the study of women at Stanford, which I pretty much think we appointed. Um, we recommended the creation of an interdisciplinary undergraduate program, which existed by that time in hundreds of colleges and universities around the country. 
I don't have, uh, well, I want to show this picture of some of us in those days, although this is while we were editing the journal Signs at the same time. We were at a meeting in which we were also dealing with feminist studies. And that's the younger me, Nan Cohen has her head down, Carol Jacklin, late Carol Jacklin in psychology, and Barbara Jelpe. And not pictured here is Shelley Rosaldo, because I think she's taking the picture, uh, because this is her backyard, I'm pretty sure. Um, we chose the name feminist studies in part to align ourselves with the emerging field of feminist scholarship, which had moved beyond woman as a subject of study. And we also chose it to indicate that the program was not for women only, but welcomed all faculty and students, and to acknowledge our role as an educational arm of the feminist movement. Despite very serious objections to that name, the university approved an individually designed interdepartmental major in 1980. It would take another decade to become a degree-granting program. And reflecting the changes of scholarship in the 21st century, it is now the program in feminist, gender, and sexuality studies. Lasting institutions, but also at high personal costs and with continuing limitations for women faculty. That generation hired in the 1970s, many of them the first or second woman in their department, faced several tenure denials and several delayed promotions, including those who built Crow and feminist studies. We often felt beleaguered outside of our feminist groups, and for good reason. In 1993, over 40% of Stanford departments still had no tenured women faculty. Now, let's look nationally and at Stanford. So we looked at the figures before of faculty women peaked at 28%, it goes down. But now, after Title IX, with the influx of women to higher education as graduate students, by 1990, 42% of faculty in the United States are female. In Stanford, it's 12%. And part of that is we were already so far behind here. They're increasing, but they're never going to catch up. Um, the 1990s is known as a period of stalled progress for professional women, but it was also a period of airing of faculty grievances at Stanford and of national attention to the problems of working women. In 1991, for example, Anita Hill's testimony in the hearings for Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas brought sexual harassment to national attention. Dr. Fran Conley, in the same year, resigned her faculty position in neurosurgery to protest ingrained gender discrimination at the medical school. And as she wrote in her memoir, Walking Out on the Boys, female medical students routinely heard comments from faculty such as, dollface, you should be home raising beautiful children, and why should anyone with your looks want to be here doing this messy work? Unwanted touching by faculty led to formal complaints from students and employees but with little response from the medical school or university. A few years later, a brave lab employee took Stanford to court for not responding to repeated sexual harassment claims in the medical school. And her court settlement insisted that the university institute sexual harassment prevention training. The discontent of faculty no doubt contributed to Provost Ger Lieberman appointing in 1992 a committee on the recruitment and retention of women faculty, chaired by Myra Strober. It reported in 1993 with devastating data. Compared to peer institutions, Stanford ranked third to last in percentage of all women faculty. Only Caltech and MIT ranked lower. The report noted that even though Stanford was coeducational from its founding, it now had fewer representation of women faculty than Yale, Princeton, and Dartmouth, which had been co-ed for less than two decades. The report called on the Stanford administration to create a culture of faculty support, better mentoring, increase the number of percent of faculty who are women, promote salary equity, and use benefits to enhance recruitment and retention, and assist faculty to combine work and family. The Strober report, as it was known, was not the turning point. Alas, we find women faculty repeatedly confronting the university. Here's a picture of some of not very happy history faculty at the Faculty Senate. Well, Laura Karstensen from Psych and the rest of us from history um, in the late 90s. But I'm ending this account with the Strobel Report, in part because it, it, it comes at a neat century after women first studied at Stanford, and in part because the story of the past generation has yet to be told. 
And I hope that today's students will engage in the research that will do so. In closing, I want to think about the legacies of the first century and what they can help us understand in terms of the dilemmas of inclusion exclusion for women at Stanford. So three concluding arguments come to mind for me. The first is I think that the initial and continuing quotas on women students did set a tone that had long lasting effects and beyond just their numerical hold. They connoted that higher education was not as important for women as for men, even as women were entering the workforce in increasing numbers throughout the century, including mothers of children. The quotas produced a time lag for Stanford, not just for students, but I think in influencing faculty hiring. I don't think, though, that the quotas explain the dilemmas nearly well enough. So my second thought is Stanford as a science, tech, and private institution. Remember, no matter how good women might have been individually at math and science, the cultures in those disciplines were not as welcoming as, say, the kinds of departments you would have had at a liberal arts college. Stanford was already tilted towards male academic culture. Even when Stanford established its national reputation, social science after World War II and humanities in the late 20th century, this gendered culture was very deep here. And as a private school, it had less accountability to the public that the state universities have, for example, less responsibility to all groups equally, at least until non-discrimination laws force the issue. And third and final point that I want to make to step back from the university is to think about the dilemmas of modern feminism. That is, the tension between the search on one hand for equality and on the other hand to recognize difference. Uh, this has characterized women's movements and women in the law and universities. On the one hand, women students and faculty have struggled to be taken seriously, to gain equal access to all fields, to all opportunities and leadership paths open to men. They have sought a life of the mind and asked not to be reduced to their reproductive or sexualized bodies. But, as one of the interviewees I quoted raised, does that require being one of the boys? Should the university also recognize the different social location of women? Not in any essentialist or universal way, but in a way that remains socially powerful. What would the university look like if the social reality of women's lives had shaped its policies? Historically, we might ask why Stanford terminated its nursing school, or why lower status has attached to the field of education. If they had been central to the mission, there would have been more women students and more women faculty, for one thing, given the opportunities at that time. Today, we might ask how the institution could help resolve the tensions between career and child rearing that so many experience, and resolve it in a way that would be of benefit to both women and men. Whatever the answer to these questions, I think we all owe a huge debt to the Stanford students, faculty, staff, administrators, and community members who made the most of their inclusions, struggled against their exclusions, and initiated the activism that we have all inherited today. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for an absolutely fabulous talk. And, and now we have some time for questions and comments, and Estelle will call on people who wish to do so. We and do have a microphone, so. Do you want to pass your mic back, Peter? There's someone, there's someone back there who wishes to, yeah. If, you, if you're willing to say your name, that would be great. I'm Patricia Angeser, and I'm a graduate, undergraduate med school and residency here. My views do not, are not congruent with what yours mm -hmm. presented. I was a uh, pre-med starting in 55. And the reason I have been loyal to Stanford is that I was encouraged by all my undergraduate male teachers. Uh, would you say again what, when you graduated, what year? 
I graduated, it was a funny graduation. I started my first year of med school the same year I graduated in 59. At 50, I graduated in 59. 59, thank you, okay. Graduated from med school in yeah. 62, mm -hmm. finished my residency in 68. Yeah. I had many male teachers that were kind, fair, and encouraged me as a mm -hmm. pre-med. And uh, I don't want everybody painted with the same brush. In med school, sure. Fran and I have hit things about this, but I was always treated respectfully. The disadvantage I had was I could not move off campus when I was a senior and my first year in med school. And I could, you know, I had to live in the row house where everybody else was their senior year. But I do not want you to paint a brush that everybody was unfair to the women pre-med. Oh, no, I, absolutely. It, what I looked at, though, when I read a lot of oral histories was a pattern of comments. And clearly, there are some women who were very happy. And indeed, so many of them said, I was treated well, but there were certain fields that they weren't encouraged to do. So one thing is, if we get more oral histories of, for example, women who went through the medical school, that pattern might look differently. So I encourage more information to come in. We have know, a I, I would never want to paint that everybody left. had the same experience. Up here to your left. Okay. I'm Jeff Fenton with two master's degrees in 1981 and 1982. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Friedman, since you mentioned Cecilia Bursiaga mm -hmm. and you mentioned that she was terminated, yeah. well, would you fill us in a little more about just exactly what happened to her? Oh, well, the official story was that there was um, financial uh, uh, reasons that there were cutbacks, but there was a sense that there had been some disagreement uh, from the administration feeling that she had spoken uh, in ways that disagreed with their policies. Yeah. And I can't say that I know the whole story. There was somebody. We have a question just right here in the back to the center. OK, and then we'll come down here to the third row. Hi, I'm Francesca. I'm currently a Hi. master's student. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk, Professor Friedman. I was wondering if you could um, speak about, or if any of the faculty that you talked to reflected on how mentorship played a role in um, creating a community or a bridge between faculty and undergraduate students. I had, so the uh, oral histories that I focused on for the period of the late 40s and early 50s did not talk very much about mentorship. And th in fact, the word probably wasn't in vogue at the time. When they talked about, say, the math study groups, that was one way of talking about we didn't get something where people were working together. But um, for the later period, I didn't, I can't say that I have seen enough evidence to know whether in the, say, 60s, 70s, and 80s, all I can say is that there were so fewer women faculty for women mentoring, women students to say role modeling or here's how I did it, that that would create a disparity. But I can't say one way or the other that people said they had it or they didn't have it from the amount that I've looked at so far. Again, I would love to get my students next quarter in the course that you took last year to do more research in the Stanford archives on these kind of questions. Yeah. Yes. Estelle, I was wondering whether you could say something about uh, how the, any nepotism rule ever applied at Stanford, because I remember how asking about this nepotism, oh, yes, because yes. I remember asking about this when I was a young faculty member in 1971 on, and uh, one of the things I learned was that the nepotism rule applied to all California employees, hmm. but as it was a state requirement, and it did not apply to private universities. However, many of the administration at Stanford assumed it did apply and then used it in making hiring decisions mm -hmm. that could uh, probably, for couples. I don't know about that law. Um, I, I can look into it. But I think that many, it was, whether it was in the law or simply in the practice, there were people who came here who were told at the time, if there will never be a job for your, and then it was always wife, not spouse. If you, you, there, we cannot have two people in the same family in the same department. It may not have been true legally, but it was definitely in practice. Yeah. I know Bob McGill. That's who I was thinking of. 
That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, I was told that. Um, we're bringing you a mic. <laughs> we're bringing you a mic. Because of what you were just saying about the nepotism rule, I just wanted to throw in, I uh, had the honor of doing an oral history with Jane Collier, and you also mentioned Shelley Rosaldo. Yes. And Jane told me that it was the head of their department in anthropology who really went to both couples, both of their husbands worked in the anthropology department. Yeah. And basically said he had a little extra money and uh, had 150% right. <laughs> funding, and they could decide how to split it. Yep. The Colliers split it 100%, 50%, and um, Shelley Rosaldo and her husband split it 50-50. Right. But I think that was in the mid-60s. So uh, early sure 70, it, it was actually the mid-70s, early. early to mid-70s. See, I can uh, that was in early 70s. Okay. Early 70s, yeah. yeah. But notice that it was, again, it was... Um, it's almost like a two for one deal, you know. You, you don't get you don't get two hundred percent. You don't get two people fully. You got the family deal, yeah. But that was like an entry point, and and the anthropology department was quite um, sort of innovative in even trying to find a way to do what we now call spouse accommodation. Uh, Stella, I have the microphone. Artie Pinnenstock. Where are you, Artie? I can't. Uh, up here. I'll stand. Oh, up. hi. I see you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all. The Rosaldos had two full-time appointments. Ah, oh, this person They knows. requested <laughs> yeah. the change from um, two 100% appointments to the 150% arrangement. I remember it well because I was vice provost at the time. Yeah. Um, I got a call from uh, uh, them asking if we could do it, and it was literally approved about 48 hours after they made the request. Yeah. Yeah. The second thing is um, the move to get rid of the quota on women started with the Committee on Undergraduate Admissions and Financial Aids. My memory is that it went through the committee, then through the faculty senate, prior to Title IX. I believe also board action took place prior to Title IX. Uh, so Title IX was not the motivator for that change. Now, you have to, there was a lawsuit, though, that was brought. It was not successful. But is it just a coincidence that it was lifted um, at the same time that the? The story is weird. I was chair of undergraduate admissions and financial aids. We had a very bright babysitter who was a student at Stanford. And as I was driving her home one night, she said, this ratio is not good for the men or the women. You're chairman of undergraduate admissions. Why don't you do something about it? <laughs> I established, or the committee established, the, the subcommittee that Ann Minor um, chaired. Uh, we had two options, either to set a 50-50 ratio or to just get rid of the rule. Mm -hmm. We chose to get rid of the rule. It went to the faculty senate where it was passed unanimously. Interestingly, then Bill Miller, the provost, yeah. said I had to take it to the board. Two weeks before I was to take it to the board, the chairman of the board called and said, can we deal with the athletic ramifications? Uh. I went to the athletic director who listened for five minutes and said, it's the right thing to do. Just do it, and we'll live with the ramifications of it. So do you remember what year this was? It had to be 72. Okay. Um, and then a week before it was to go to the board, Bill Hewlett called and said, tell Artie, I've done my homework, and if there's any problem at the board, um, I'm prepared to back him up. At the board, the only comment was a male trustee who said after the presentation, it's about time. <laughs> the only opposition we faced was in court from a woman in Palo Alto. So the rule was instituted by a woman, and the only opposition that we faced in the end was from a woman. Fortunately, the judge ruled her out of order. Uh -huh. 
and uh, it went through. Yay, Ordi! I think we might have time yeah, for yeah, we one the last question. Name. <laughs> And I, uh, Artie, I hope this is in your oral history. I think it is. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any, do we have time for one more? Or we, we do have time for one last one if there are any questions. If not, we can. All right, one last brave soul. Hello, my name is Janine Valadez. I'm class of 81, BSEE. I just wanted to make the comment I was in the double E program and I was the in terms, I don't remember what the stats were upon entry in 1977, but by graduation, I was one of three females that graduated with double E. And my experience of um, all of my courses, I didn't decide on my major until the end of my junior year, the very last second that you had to decide, because I couldn't decide amongst a bunch of degrees that I wanted to pursue. But I went to double E because I was very driven to make money. and. And, you know, it was a good decision for me because it enabled me to do a lot of the other things that I wanted to do in life besides working in the industry. My experience at Stanford was um, I got to know the other two women pretty well, but we didn't socialize. We were in different social groups. But within the coursework, we knew of each other. And my experience was distinctly different from theirs, and I have thought for decades on why that was. And the only conclusion I can come to now is that um, in terms of my rapport with my classmates, it, it tended to be very good. My relationships with advisors and professors was a completely different thing. I was, I, everything that you said mm -hmm. as far as not being recognized, mm -hmm. being questioned, I don't know how many times I was called into professors' offices with accusations of cheating on my tests because of the results, and they were incongruent with their expectations of what my results should be. Um, so it was a very bimodal experience for me. Mm -hmm. it, support from my fellow classmates, but pretty horrible treatment from, I, I went to my advisors maybe twice and never went back, mm -hmm. because it was just a shame, you know, I was shamed in terms of what I was trying to do. And then I, in terms of why, why were things so great, because my, my peers, my two other female peers, um, didn't have good experiences with their classmates. And the only thing I can write up is that I was an athlete. So I was an athlete, and I made lots of guy friends. And I came to Stanford with a classmate from my high school that was on the water polo team. I was field hockey. And so we always came to preseason together and formed a circle of friends around us. So I gained a lot of male camaraderie mm -hmm. in the school. And that's the only thing I can kind of hang my hat on. No proof. It's all conjecture on my part. But my fellow females did not have that thing going for them. And I think it allowed men to maybe question their motivations. And uh, I have no proof. It's just conjecture. But that, I was that, that was my difference. Well, I think that you really bring it back to the first question, which is there are many individual experiences. There's no one story. But the more evidence we can gather, the more memoirs and oral histories and papers and archives, the better we'll be able to tell this history in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor. We really appreciate your taking the time. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Okay.